Many precious artifacts have been recovered within Egypt over the years. Many ancient Egyptian tombs found intact, untouched for millennia, still containing the valuable items left for their kings, with the intention of their beloved pharaoh's use in their passage to the afterlife. And with the mountains of gold and glistening jewels which have captured the attention and the hearts of those who have explored these ancient archives, a lot of the most astounding relics go largely unnoticed. The solar boat could be seen as a particularly good example of this mass overlooking of the most interesting of things. At the foot of the Great Pyramid, once beneath several multi-ton, precisely placed blocks of limestone, lay the Khufu ship, a full-sized ancient Egyptian vessel sealed into a pit over 4,000 years ago. Why is more not heard regarding this astonishing find? Strongly believed to have been built for Khufu, King Cheops, who was the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty of the old kingdom of Egypt. The ship is now preserved in the Giza Solar Boat Museum, built at the site in 1985. It is completely dedicated to the preservation of the boat, possessing state-of-the-art preservation technologies. Khufu's ship is one of the oldest, largest, and best-preserved vessels from antiquity. It measures 44 meters long and 6 meters wide. It is also acknowledged as the world's oldest intact ship, and has been described by all in the know as a masterpiece of woodcraft. It could sail today if put into water. However, what is clearly the most amazing fact regarding the solar ship, the vessel was never intended to sail on water. The solar boat was built to sail through the air. It was built largely of Lebanon cedar planking in the shell first construction technique, using unpegged tenons of Christ's thorn. The ship was built with a flat bottom composed of several planks, but no actual keel, with the planks and frames lashed together with halfa grass. The boat was found complete, but in pieces across the layer's floor, laid in a logically disassembled order beneath the pyramid. Subsequently reconstructed from the 1,224 pieces which were laid out in order over 45 years prior. It took several years for the boat to be painstakingly reassembled, primarily by the Egyptian Department of Antiquities chief restorer, Ahmed Youssef Mustafa. Before reconstructing the boat, he had to gain enough experience on ancient Egyptian boat building. He studied the reliefs carved on walls and tombs and many of the little wooden models of ships and boats found in tombs. Ahmed also visited the Nile boatyards of Old Cairo and Mahadi and went to Alexandria, where wooden river boats were still being made. It is now believed to have been known as a solar barge, a ritual vessel to carry the king with the sun god Ra across the heavens. However, it bears some of the signs of having been used, a fact which has baffled many researchers due to the ship's only purpose being that of floating in the sky. It is possible that the ship was either a funerary barge, used to carry the king's embalmed body from Memphis to Giza, or even that Khufu himself used it as a pilgrimage ship to visit holy places, and that it was buried for him to use in the afterlife. Yet burning questions arise from such conclusions. Firstly, how would the ship fly? Secondly, if the ship was indeed intended to be used in King Khufu's afterlife, why was it resting in pieces beneath the pyramid? And why did it show wear from use within the king's life? Did this ship somehow once possess the power of flight? Did ancient Egyptians? We have been covering a lot recently in regards to the compelling evidence left by the ancient Egyptians, revealing their advanced ability to traverse most of the Earth prior to Columbus. Is the solar ship a piece of this puzzle? Kamal el Malak, who somehow predicted the existence of the ship and has been attributed with its discovery in 1954 through his extensive personal research of the area over 14 years, initially found another pit also at the foot of the Great Pyramid. Unfortunately, it seems this layer had been robbed shortly before he found it. Archaeologists and Egyptologists alike rejected his claims of some sort of ship having been within this empty cavern. Yet when the other pit was found, which did indeed contain a ship, his prior claim was vindicated. How did Kamal know? 
He would later claim that he believes something rather special was stolen from that first cavern. Could it have been the thing which made the ship work? Regardless of this other cavern's lost contents, the solar boat is certainly an amazing thing in its own right. There exists a smorgasbord of imaginative theories pertaining to the original construction of many ancient sites found all over Earth. Egypt's Giza Plateau being the melting pot and often the site of initiation for many an astute researcher. A realization of not only the megalithic anomalies, but also the academic ignorance. As we have previously mentioned, a discovery first shared here upon our channel, enormous granite stones exposed on the east side of Cheops. has not only revealed the size of the original blocks, but the extensive erosion upon them. This fact is a highly controversial piece of evidence. The stones, which are clearly more modern casing stones, conceal what were already highly eroded blocks, masterfully covered later on in their lives. It confirms our claim that they were a conservation effort, vindicating our claims of immense age and revealing academia's ignorance to not only be deliberate, but possibly conspiratorial. As technology has advanced, it has allowed for many theories to be tested on computer programs. By testing real-world tensions and stresses, allowing us to weed out the ideas that would have been simply impossible. The most interesting outcome of this so far is undoubtedly the theories surrounding cracks in the weight-bearing blocks in the Grand Gallery. Computer simulation has shown that these blocks easily withstand the weight above. So, to have cracked at some time in history, a substantial additional weight was added. And although many of these same academics are now convinced that this was some form of counterweight, we know that these enormous, presumed weight-bearing blocks are not the only ones to be found within the structures. These enormous stones have rendered many theories regarding the original build as incomplete. However, there exists a theory which seemingly fits not only for the placement of the casing stones, but also the mysterious semi-crushed Grand Gallery. Khufu's ship, a vessel we have covered in the past, found masterfully dismantled and placed in order of its construction at the base of the Grand Pyramid, has been found to possess some intriguing features. Author and researcher Itzvan Soros puts forward this highly compelling hypothesis concerning the many unusual characteristics of the Khufu ship, and indeed their connection to the movement and placement of the casing stones which we see today. This theory involves the flooding of the Nile to accomplish these placements. This would explain the unimaginably immense weight that the pyramids clearly once experienced, and the cracks within the gallery blocks. Itzvan goes into detail, explaining that much of the boat could have been repaired and replaced at ease, and most interestingly, that it could be deliberately flooded at will. Even recognizing and explaining their unusual docking stations found all along the shores of Sakura. Did the Khufu ship really have something to do with the conservation stones found upon the great monuments? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. There are many unusual artifacts that can now be thankfully found within countless private collections all over the world, all of them currently unexplained by modern science. Stones made from pure oxygen, metal objects created in a zero-g environment, unexplained glass cups, slabs and tools, the list grows, and our next artifact of interest could have even once resided within the legendary city of Atlantis. 47 pieces of a mysterious alloy many have attributed to a metal once known as orichalcum. A metal, many say, was only ever found within the once highly advanced city of Atlantis. Discovered within a shipwreck off the coast of Sicily, they were found during an expedition to a wreck believed to be over 2,600 years old. The ship was previously explored in 2015, 
when underwater archaeologists found 39 ingots of another mysterious metal, the details of which not yet released to the public. This trip, however, yielded an ancient jar, two Corinthian helmets, and the 47 lumps of ancient orichalcum, said to have been smelted upon the fabled island of Atlantis. Plato specifically described this rare metal as having been mined there. He even described a temple dedicated to Poseidon, having an entire pillar made from orichalcum. Interestingly, after the discovery in 2005, officials began to conceal the true identity of this mysterious metal, attributing other metals, such as copper and gold, found at the site as orichalcum. News Corp Australia also reported that tradition had it that orichalcum was made of copper, gold, and silver, this statement having no historical accuracy whatsoever. Furthermore, the metal found by the shipwreck team was said to have matched the ancient descriptions of orichalcum. Are they really surviving artifacts from the lost city of Atlantis? They are undoubtedly incredible ancient artifacts and compelling evidence to support the past existence of a highly advanced civilization that once flourished here upon our planet. What exactly is orichalcum, and why is it mentioned within so many ancient texts pertaining to the past existence of Atlantis? And why are the dive team and the subsequent researchers of their finds so convinced of the alloy's identity we find the discovery highly compelling? Most people assume that only modern man had mastered the skill of flight. The slow development of technology and advancements in manufacturing techniques, allowing us to make more and more precise components, enabling exhaustive trial and error until flight was accomplished. However, there exists a series of documents written in the world's earliest language, which not only detail the construction of such flying machines, but even documents the test flights of these ancient flying crafts. The Mahabharata, the Ramayama, and the Puranas are just a few of these ancient Indian texts written in Sanskrit which detail these flight tests. The texts, in fact, give surprisingly detailed accounts of these ancient airships, also known as Vimanas. Detailed descriptions of the ship's construction are also given, with ancient wording which has since been translated into such phrases as graphite rod, copper coils, crystal indicator, stable angles, among many others. The texts also include details on anti-gravity, invisibility, photography, weapons, and interplanetary travel. For example, the following excerpt describes the propulsion and movement of the Vimana. Strong and durable must the body of the Vimana be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside, one must put the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus underneath. By means of the power latent in the mercury, which sets the driving whirlwind in motion, a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in the sky. The movements of the Vimana are such that it can vertically ascend, vertically descend, move slanting forwards and backwards. With the help of the machines, human beings can fly in the air and heavenly beings can come down to Earth. Additionally, the following example is from one of the texts which demonstrates the power that these ships possessed. Gurkha, flying in his swift and powerful Vimana, hurled against the three cities of the Varishnis and Andahakas, a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe an incandescent column of smoke and fire, as brilliant as 10,000 suns, rose in all its splendor. It was the unknown weapon, the Iron Thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Varishnis and Andahakas. The corpses were so burnt that they were no longer recognizable. Hair and fingernails fell out, pottery broke without cause, foodstuffs were poisoned, to escape, the warriors threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. It is speculated that the original writers of those texts were from an ancient civilization. 
they are also argued to have actually recorded real events which occurred between 15,000 and 26,000 years ago. The remnants of an ancient civilization with weapons similar to that of a nuclear warhead that existed in Pakistan and India over 15,000 years ago. The texts were originally passed down orally from generation to generation, and were finally written down and preserved by Indian priests. Although debunking efforts have been experienced, the sheer antiquity of the scripts this information is found upon has left such explanations severely lacking. For instance, the academically accepted theory being that the texts are merely from Indian mythology, written between 300 BCE and 300 CE. This clearly in denial of the evidence, which suggests they are far older. However, evidence that the same such fields would usually embrace, yet when this means a conceding of such facts, they chose to ignore said evidence in favor of shaky alternatives. The texts are available for anyone to read. We implore you to investigate them yourselves for an insight into our very distant past. Our mission upon our channel is to compile and present enough evidence of the existence of a past, highly capable, technologically advanced ancient civilization that once flourished here upon our planet, that it not only proves their existence beyond reasonable doubt, but vindicates all those who have either lost careers, funding or worse, just for telling the truth. Our intention is to display to the world that a civilization once lived here on our planet that not only mastered the art of stone masonry, but quarried, moved, and built with stones of such gigantic weights, not only do their activities escape modern explanation, but have been deliberately ignored, covered up, and denied by an academia who claim to have all the answers. There are many areas of the planet which still possess many of these compelling artifacts, not only supporting our premise and conviction, but baffle all who try to explain them. And although, predictably, rarely shared by academics the world over, one of these ancient places is known to the modern man as Italy. Seemingly littered with not only polygonal masonry, ancient pyramidal structures, multi-ton lintels and archways, but contains countless other compelling, extremely ancient yet surviving features, which not only indicates the existence of this past civilization, but have been investigated by a number of alternative antiquarians throughout the eras, who, after in-depth analysis, have come to predictably startling conclusions in regards to their age and, indeed, possible origins. We have in the past covered a number of these ancient sites, one of which being the Cyclopean Wall, which still surrounds the ancient Acropolis of Alatre, and indeed the astonishing polygonal masonry which makes up the apparently Greek-constructed Necromantion, a place not only proven due to the polygonal architecture to undoubtedly predate this academic explanation, but also, thanks to our own study of the site, has fingerprints left by a tool within the main chamber said to be the passageway to the underworld of Hades that we have identified and linked to a number of other unexplained sites found throughout the world. However, this coverage of the Italian relics we have so far explored is but a fragment of what is actually hidden among the winding streets and rolling hills of Italy. Alternative researchers, most notably Giuseppe Lugli, have carried out studies of the unexplained polygonal techniques which can still be found existing within Italy. The ancient fortifications and polygonal walls, which were researched and initially noted by Giuseppe, include Alatri, Norma, Arpino, Assini, Saracena Gate, Cosa, Alba Fusens, Segni, Pigra, Blera, Lazio, Bomarzo, Latium, San Felice Circio, Latina, Chiusi, Etruria, Toscania, Vitrala, Viterbo, Monte Albano, Sovana, Toscana, Nardo di Pace, Tirna, Lago di Pitiluca, Orvieto, Umbria, Tuscany, Marema, Sorano, Syracuse, Sicily, Val di Saviore, Serviteri, Savignano, and so on. As Richard Cassero puts it, 
a modern researcher of these enigmatic ruins, quote, The countryside around Rome is littered with relics of a past more or less remote. One feels almost a continuity there, between the ancient and the modern world, with the ancient Roman ruins being almost a familiar presence, as if part of the natural landscape. Yet one also finds there remains of a much older and mysterious past. Massive cyclopean walls encircle towns and villages, their stones darkened by the passing of centuries and millennia. One can never get used to them, so strange they are in their interlocking geometries and so different from the familiar contours of Roman and medieval walls. They loom as a relic from an entirely different past of which we know almost nothing." End quote. And as mentioned, although we have only personally covered the Cyclopean walls surrounding Alatri, similar ancient fortifications can seemingly be found enclosing countless other ancient ruins all over Italy. The small towns of Sutri, Emilia, Pelestrina, Ferentino, Segni, Cesa, Veroli, and Arpino, all in the province of Frosinone, Norba, Cori, and Circe, Cortona, Cuma in the province of Latina, Emilia in nearby Umbria, as far as Ancedonia, Orbitello, and Roselle in Tuscany and Alba Fucens in Abruzzo, are entirely surrounded by Cyclopean walls, surviving to this day in various states of preservation, an indication of a fear these people had of some form of outsider. The stone walls, some of which constructed from truly gigantic blocks, each weighing many tons, are as finely fitted together as the many other mortarless ruins found elsewhere the world over, such as within ancient Peru. But it is their near-impossible acute angles and interlocking corners that cause the greatest of amazement, that just like the polygonal masonry found all over the world, was created as if each stone was individually carved to be a piece of a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. These features, along with their gigantic scale, are relics not only overlooked by the thousands of people who visit Italy each year, but, as we have previously discussed, are overwhelming evidence of an ancient civilization far more capable than any of the well-studied ancestors that academia claim as the original builders. These remnants are undoubtedly evidence of a past civilization that were not only vastly more proficient in masonry than even the modern man, but were also obsessed with building enclosed fortifications, as if to avoid some form of outside invader or possible natural threat. Who built ancient Italy? Why did they build with such focus on fortification? How old are these relics? We feel that due to their inexplicable nature, they are undoubtedly relics left by a now lost civilization, yet continue to be ignored by an academia who deny this people's past existence. Regardless of these denials, we find ancient Italy highly compelling. There are many ancient places upon our planet, which we are yet to cover upon our channel. Many intriguing, unexplainable, and thus controversial ancient ruins that, although more than likely discovered and noted by an academic at some point within modern history, has since been banished to selective ignorance deliberately overlooked. This often in favor of retaining one's funding within a certain field of study. Ancient quarries is an area of study that is indeed filled with these ancient anomalies. Seemingly machined stones litter many of the more intriguing locations, one of them undoubtedly Aswan Quarry, not only containing an unfinished obelisk of gigantic proportions, but also seemingly later additions carved as if left by a later advanced civilization. Additionally, the more prehistoric quarries that can be found dotting America's Great Lakes, notably Superior, copper mines and quarries fly in the face of currently attested chronology regarding ancient man. We presume that the most compelling of these sites had indeed since their initial modern rediscovery been widely studied by alternative researchers, 
However, Cava di Cusa seems to have been largely overlooked, regardless of its astonishing ancient relics, which can be found at the site. Located three kilometers south of Campobella di Massara, in the province of Trapani, Italy, the entire quarry, and indeed the length of the ruin, is an astonishing 1.8 kilometers long, located upon a natural ridge spanning from east to west. According to academia, this site was quarried from the beginning of the first half of the 6th century BC. This, regardless of the clearly shifted, mysteriously abandoned, gigantic, unexplainable megaliths which still litter the site. We feel, with such unexplainably large stones seemingly left in situ at the site, like many other unexplained sites that can be found on Earth, were built by an advanced ancient civilization capable of building with such enormous stones. The quarry was abandoned in 409 BC, when it was captured by the Carthaginians. Regardless of academia's limited opinions regarding the quarry, we feel the most interesting and possibly most controversial anomalies to unravel are the abandoned cuts still at the site. Just what were these ancient people making? Why did they abandon these curious megaliths where they lay today? How were they able to shift such enormous stones? We feel there is strong evidence to suggest that Cava de Cusa was an ancient quarry once used and mysteriously abandoned by a lost civilization once capable of shifting unimaginably enormous stones and, as such, is highly compelling. Many of the words which we use in the modern day are derived from far more ancient sources than most would imagine. Many of the words that we use for objects and activities, which have been around since time immemorial, have their named origins placed near the birth of some of the earliest civilizations to have ever walked upon our planet. As such, if beings such as giants did once exist on Earth, one would not only expect to find enormous unexplained ruins, but also these lexical inspirations given to the activities undertaken by these huge people. Is it then just a mere coincidence that ancient enormous stone walls are often named Cyclopean? Cyclops, having once been an ancient one-eyed giant within ancient Greek and Roman mythology. Is it also but a mere coincidence that the giant found within biblical stories named Goliath was also a one-eyed beast. Was the name given to these enormous ruins a clue to their original builders? A clue left upon spoken language, a remnant far more difficult to erase from history than any physical remains. Found everywhere on Earth, and even dotting some of the most remote tropical islands, these Cyclopean ruins still perplex us to this day. Many of the ancient Cyclopean ruins that can be found within developed areas have often been draped with modern architecture. Many suspect that this is often done in an attempt to conceal the true nature of these sites. Italy is a particularly good example of a country drenched in Cyclopean architecture yet chooses to overlook such wonders in favor of modern development. Scattered throughout ancient Latinium, and yet again, coincidentally, placed at the location of a later flourishing civilization, and actually the first real modern world superpower, Rome, are ruins undoubtedly left by an as yet not publicly disclosed or studied branch of ancient beings who were capable of feats we are yet to unravel. Many classical writers and historians, including Homer, Hesiod, Plutarch, Thuclides, and Diodorus Siculus, among others, posited the idea that the Cyclopean ruins of Italy and others within Europe were erected by this now extinct Cyclopean race. And we seemingly continue to carry this torch. For, to heavily research, not only these particular areas of ancient architecture, but the many individuals who have made remarkable discoveries over the years, along with reels of newspaper archives with an interest in these particular finds, and also the suspected individuals tasked with the possible concealment of such. 
the proposition of an unknown, ancient race of controversial beings, possibly much larger than modern humans, having once existed on our planet, has become overwhelming. Why are ancient ruins, seemingly built by a race of giants, actually named after giants? A name with origins placed far within our distant past. Did an ancient race of giants once build the countless unexplained ruins found on virtually every continent? We find the evidence within some areas to suggest such overwhelming. Many civilizations have been and gone here upon our planet. Yet thanks to the time within history in which certain civilizations flourished, countless artifacts and historical studies can and have been undertaken into their existence. We are able to decipher their daily lives, their religious beliefs and practices, even their languages. However, in doing so, we have never been able to decode any knowledge or explanation for the countless, seemingly impossible ancient feats lost abilities of stonemasonry, no documentation found within any hieroglyph, literature, parchment, or other ancient text, yet pyramids, polygonal masonry, multi-thousand-ton megaliths, along with countless other curious, clear signatures of a lost civilization's work exists. And due to this mystery regarding how these sites were created, we have to presume that those who constructed them were placed at a far earlier time within history, one that was prior to a global flood, possibly the aftermath of a near-extinction-level event, manifesting as a form of global amnesia and severing connections between continents, possibly for 10,000 years. Segesta within Sicily not only looks the same age as that of the foundation walls of Baalbek, and indeed the gargantuan megaliths found within the Trilithon, but the enormous temple is still standing along with its amphitheater, which, if we look to the still surviving polygonal stage flooring present at the theater within Delphi, a site we have covered in the past, one which is also littered with polygonal walls. We find more support for the theory that these amphitheaters, with their incredible acoustics, are also remnants left by this same lost civilization. Yet we feel the smoking gun are the protuberances which are still visible within its foundation blocks. It is of no surprise to us that its origins are hotly contested, with many academic teams concluding that it was merely the work of traveling Trojans. This regardless of the multi-ton columns that were so perfectly laid, they all still stand to this day. When one considers that protuberances are found on polygonal masonry all around the world, and that modern stonemasons are now exploring interlocking blocks, with some such as large Lego blocks already in mass production, it is no surprise that while many claim it to be Greek, others claim it not. This will not cease anytime soon. Many religious beliefs have gained traction in regard to its original purpose. Thus, conveniently, there is little chance that this contention will move forward. Who built the ruins of Segesta? When did they build them? We find the possibilities highly compelling. 